Hi there, I'm Fred. Um, I am, um, apologize first of all, um, uh, I take a lot of morphine and cannabis for pain. So I'm going to be moving around and get in different positions so I'm comfortable. So if I go, oh, all of a sudden, don't worry about it, that's just my normal. Um, so as you uh, uh, get disabled, you have a new normal, which is not working and um, developing something to do. So I was growing cannabis, I couldn't figure out uh, find all the information online, so I built my own web, my own uh, uh, website, and uh, got a lot of experience finding different pick crops out in the field. This is a Fort Vermilion last year, so I've, uh, I'm, I would consider myself a veteran grower. I'm not a master grower. Um, I, I planted my first seeds in 1976. Sorry, um, a little too far away from the mic. Um, so. Um, and I became uh, number 84 in Canada as being a legal um, grower in Canada. So I had a lot of fun with it, and then um, all of a sudden I needed surgery, and my pain uh, physician said, hey, you know, uh, you have ulcerative colitis, you take cannabis oil, you already have your medical marijuana, get it. Um, but it was uh, a little expensive, um, and I was taking a lot of opioids as well. So the oils, I can tell you, really help decrease the amount of opioids I take, probably by 50%. Uh, if I didn't have cannabis, I probably would not be here today. So the oils are expensive from your LPs, and when I started, I was taking one of these little things, $125 a day, and I was going, holy jump, and this is expensive. So I started making my own oils and, because it was much cheaper. I can make a liter for $125 now. So it's, uh, uh, and my ulcerative colitis is gone. I didn't need surgery. So uh, Health Canada, um, so you need, the first thing you need to do is get your medical uh, marijuana certificate from your doctor and send it to Health Canada. And at the same time, figure out, uh, um, whoops, this is an old one. Ah, what LPs um, we, um, <laughs> We have, so you send your documents to Health Canada and it does take a long time. Uh, they are getting better, but it is a long process waiting for it to happen. But in the end, you will have beautiful cannabis that you control. You know exactly what goes into it. We use no pesticides, 100% uh, environment, um, pro positive environment to make the cannabis grow properly and get good success. So to get your license to grow, and uh, the first thing, when you send in your application at your doctor's office, you also fill out, decide which one of these LPs you want to join, and also fill out the documents for your website. Ah, wrong word. Uh, sorry, here's uh, a different explanation of uh, cannabis from Can Farm. And along here is the terpene profile. So every cannabis has a different um, effect, and that's called the entourage effect. Um, so, um, Girl Scout cookies might be good for you, but not for somebody else. So, you have to figure out what type of cannabis you want and what works for you. As Tangerine Dream, uh, as the name says, it's good for sleep. So, um, there's 113 cannabinoids in uh, cannabis, THC, CBD, CBN, and um, there's a, you know, a variety and a mix and, and different things that they do for your body. So you find out what your ailment is and then find the right area of the cannabis that works for you. For example, oh, you can't see this for some reason. Why the, oh, down on the bottom here it says aged. So that means cured. A lot of cannabis you get it as green and it doesn't have the CBN and the, the CBD because that is where you... Um, when you heat it, you get your THC from your THCA, so you never have to worry about your kids eating uh, cannabis that's raw. Nothing will happen. Um, in fact, up here in the raw, juicing uh, raw cannabis leaves, just like carrot juice, it's very good for your body. And certain ailments work very, if you need it, like stomach ailments and that sort of thing, uh, having raw cannabis juice is uh, amazing for the system, and it's a craze actually in California right now. So you have to, while you've got your um, application gone to Health Canada, you're waiting, you have to decide what you want to grow. So sativa plants are your daytime high pot, and that, they're very uplifting and uh, good active mind. 
um, but they can grow 10 feet tall. So in a grow indoor grow environment, you need to control them and trellis them and manage the plant. So it takes more work. The indica, they don't take a lot of work. They're like little Christmas trees, but you're always going to have that couch lock uh, cannabis. The ruderalis is a, what they use for um, making your auto flowering plants. So they flower early. But if you're growing outdoors, I always suggest growing your seeds and making uh, clones. <clears throat> this company here states that they can take your saliva and determine which uh, cannabis works for you. Not quite sure if that works, but uh, hey, amazing. We get our certificate finally back from Health Canada. And uh, as you can see, I expire in July, so I've got to do some work and get recertified again. Sorry about that. But I can grow 25 plants and have a little over a kilo of dried marijuana. I can carry 150 grams of cannabis at any one time. So I've got a, brought a little bit of cannabis and cannabis lotion that I make and hashish and uh, keef and different things if anybody wants to have a look afterwards. Oh, by the way, um, we, uh, if you want interactive, yeah. if somebody has questions as we go along, um, you can, uh, oh. Crystal will Hi. take your questions. <clears throat> I don't think this mic's on. On, but not on. Okay. Um, so this is um, after we've dried our cannabis and we've jarred it and we're um, ready to um, cure it. So curing after you've dried it, a lot of people don't do and a lot of LPs don't know about it, especially if they have bought an MMPR and uh, they've never done it or seen the process. So this is very important because this cures and changes your cannabis and makes, uh, brings out qualities that you don't otherwise have. So to path to success for growing a good crop starts with getting your seeds. Wrong slide, it's supposed to be a different slide here. So you can get a, um, Health Canada states that they want you to get your starting material, either seeds or clones from an LP. When I started, LPs didn't even have starting material. So you got them from wherever, Crop King Seeds, uh, DNA Genetics, um, Amsterdam guys, can't remember their names at the moment. But there, there's lots of places to get starting material, and once it becomes legalized, you'll find a lot of places that are going to be out there selling a lot more. Your head shops, you can typically buy seeds as you go. So you start them off, there you go, your solo cups, you got your seeds going, and now you're at your three-inch pot, you're full, you're ready to transplant and do one of two things, either go stay, go to your six-inch pot, or go to the field. <laughs> so this field actually extends 800 meters down to there. It's all the way across there, and it's 800 by 800 meters grown Mexican style. So it's interesting how these Mexican traditions come up to Canada. I don't quite get it. but uh, And uh, just flag me down if you have a question. I'm watching the crowd, so just throw your hand up, and I'm happy to bring the mic your way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, grow tents are probably the simplest way to go. Um, with them, a lot of times they come with your carbon filter, your light, your timer set up, and you can either go organic or go um, with um, a water system. The main things are standards of operations for all indoor growth. And the biggest thing is humidity and controlling your humidity, especially in the final phases. Because even in Calgary, with our low humidity, trying to dry your cannabis so that you don't have mold, because that's when it's going to set in. And if you have too dense of buds, sorry, it matters on your genetics. So you have to watch what you're growing and control your humidity or you lose it right at the end. So um, you can uh, do a couple of different things. Uh, this is a crop that the flowers are ready to come out in the front. And in the back, this is a vegetative stage just going into flower. So with this process, by cloning and continually doing this cycle, we get a crop every two months. Your initial crop is six months. Now, <clears throat> some of the techniques um, that uh, we have don't work on all cannabis. Some of them, you want to have that center colas coming up. I mean, that is, was an amazing plant. So um, you still have side coluses coming off that are good, but this main bud was, um, I don't know, we, we get average five ounces a plant. So uh, when you do things properly, you get very good success. And of course, you need a green thumb. I think that's very important. <clears throat> so this diagram illustrates a 6-inch and a 10-inch pot, how you um, tr uh, train it. Um, this would be a sativa. Um, and you know they grow monsters. I mean, uh, I've seen them 12 feet tall out in the fields. So you let them grow uh, wild, and it's amazing what they can do. 
Um, so um, when you uh, take the cannabis uh, and want to harvest it, you have to look at the trichomes, and we're missing these slides. Uh, so trichomes are very important to determine whether your crop are ready, uh, is ready. And there's a couple of stages. They're um, clear, then they go amber, then they go cloudy. And what is the right stage? And your whole plant isn't going to be all the same. You're going to have different if you've got lower buds. So we try to keep our buds in the same height, called trellising, so that your light is hitting the same structure. The buds down here, way weaker, don't do anything. If you can get all your buds up to the same area and get all the light hitting at the same time, it makes for optimal growing surfaces. So always prepare your surfaces beforehand because those trichomes stick to everything. Glass, um, the white plastic sheeting that you can get, black on white side, white on the other works great. And wear gloves. Um, I mean, your hands will stink and uh, you have to clean off your scissors all the time. So when you've uh, cleaned your scissors off, smoke that. That's your hash. And that'll tell you what your pot's going to smell, taste like right then. <laughs> it, it's amazing. You know exactly what your pot's going to be just by taking that hash right there. It's really good. <clears throat> ah, there's supposed to be trichomes on this side. <laughs> so um, I always put my plants in the dark for a day or two before we trim. Um, it makes the plants, plants go through a, an oxygen cycle where the photosynthesis, they take in CO2 during the day and at night they put out oxygen so that they clean their pores. Well, that does an amazing thing to your cannabis. So when you crop your cannabis, that's why out in the fields you always go first thing in the morning before the, the light comes out and that's when they're cropping. Midday you do not want to crop. Um, so you always crop them, or at least we do, um, to get the full potency after they've been in the dark for a couple of days. And you get beautiful trichomes coming off them. <clears throat> and they're ready for drying. So you throw them in a, uh, we use a shower, <laughs> and you, every couple of months, and it takes about four days in Calgary to dry these with the fan on steady. Um, and you're, this is the one stage you are going to have smell going outside because most household um, fans don't have a carbon filter on it. So uh, just to be aware during those couple of days, you're probably going to be really stinky in the neighborhood. And unfortunately, stink is one of the things that gets people busted and in the old days. And now if you're an ACMPR, you still want to follow those same security rules. Don't tell anybody about it. Keep your smell under control. Use carbon filters. And you know, don't sell it. Um, it's illegal. You will get busted. But I can tell you that my parents and my sister and my realtor all came to my house and I was growing and nobody knew. So if you do it right, it works. Um, cannabis smoke stinks. It's 30 times worse than cigarette smoke for, um, for spreading. So um, there's a lot of uh, things that you can use. The PAX-3, the Volcano. Um, I had a couple other things up there um, that uh, really work on reducing the smell. Decarboxylation when you're making edibles. Uh, one of the stinkiest things. Um, so I found a new thing called the Argent Lift. It's a very small, I've got a photo of it, hopefully, ahead. Uh, but it's a very small machine. It holds about a half an ounce ground of cannabis. But um, you put the lid on it, a silicone lid, and it does not smell. It runs a cycle with an algorithm on a circuit board. And away you go. Uh, so it's getting exactly the right temperature because I don't know how many people have seen different recipes for decarboxylating your pot. Yeah, because there's no standard. So th the nice thing with this is that it's the same every time, and it works. So it's been very, very effective. Um, so one thing you got to do is um, take your cannabis. Oh, there's the urgent lift. And, um, and reduce it. Um, get rid of the stalks and that sort of thing down to bud size. And whether in the old days when you were in an MMPR and you were selling it to uh, a dispensary, this is what they want to see. They want to see the buds right down to the smallest. They don't want to see the, the, the one-foot colas. They don't like that. You can't sell it. <laughs> it doesn't dry properly. So you need to decarboxylate your cannabis before you cook it. And I recommend using the Magical Butter Maker. Uh, again, the same thing as decarboxylating your cannabis. Uh, how many recipes for making butter? It, it's just amazing how many different ways there are, and it's hard. So this butter maker actually has uh, four different temperature settings. Uh, you can set uh, how, sorry, five different temperature settings and four different settings for time. And I make oils, butters, 
um, and everything so you can make your own edibles. The one thing with edibles, um, if anybody saw the, the cooking show earlier, um, to be consistent, you have to make your butter and mix it 100% through everything. And, uh, you know, in the old days, it was you put your cannabis buds right in your spaghetti or whatever. And it just doesn't work that way. You need to either make your butter or your oils. And this is what saved my gut. And cannabis oils are amazing. I was taking a 35 mil every day, and uh, that was going to cost me 125 bucks. So I was making a liter for that using our own cannabis, taking it through the butter maker first of all. And all the recipes, by the way, are on the website. Um, so, and all the forms, if you want to fill out for getting your ACMPR, there's a medical uh, form under the ACMPR uh, subtitle, and you can, the form for growing your own cannabis is on there as well. And my business cards are up here if you want to pick one up afterwards. So, um, the other thing make out of the oil, there's many things that can be made, and I take a hemp brand um, lotion because it's already made of hemp oil, and I add two ounces of my oil to it and rub it in the hands and it is the best moisturizer. And if you have osteoarthritis like my sister does, uh, I have to make a jug, uh, thing of that for her every month because uh, she goes through it and uses it to, uh, to help her hands. <coughs> I'm sorry? Yep, yeah, you bet. When you run it through the, uh, actually before you put it through the magical butter maker, You've got to uh, decarboxylate it uh, through the lift, or in the old ways, was in the oven. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the caps, um, this, each cap is one thousandth of an ounce of cannabis. So such a little amount, it's amazing. Like, I have to take ten of them to even notice it. And my sister takes one a night. She doesn't sleep. And she takes one a night, and that's all she needs. So um, for people who don't smoke, don't use cannabis, it's a great alternative. And it tastes terrible. It's made out of vegetable glycerin. So again, you make it the same way through the magical butter maker. Fred, we've got one more question right here. Okay. Uh, yeah, just wondering about decarboxylating. Um, are you able to put, you know, freshly picked buds in there? Or do you have to cure it before you decarboxylate it with that Argent machine you're talking about? You mean uh, green buds? Yeah. Um, well, you should cure your cannabis. Uh, if you cure your cannabis, you get better results. You get a better pot. Um, so by, by curing it, first of all, uh, you get a much better prop, uh, crop. But I can tell you, we had a crop uh, that was, we found an early stage infestation of um, spider mites. So killed the whole crop and all the veg and everything. But the flowers were then within a week of uh, flowering. So we froze them, and we created a hash, <laughs> actually, out of it. But we froze them green, and then we did a process. We trimmed everything down to the small buds, added dry ice, and uh, uh, made keef out of it. And so we had to do it in many stages, and then got it down to hash. And I got a chunk of hash up here I can show you huh, from this okay. batch. Thank you. No worries. No, this is actually Vixen um, Gold. <laughs> Sorry? Early Vixen. Uh, that, it's a seed that does not on the market anymore because it was such a wily sativa, grew mangy, and you have to control it. So we like the pot, so uh, we smoke twice as much of it as anything else. So <laughs> we got to keep growing it, what can I say? <laughs> So one of the problems with LPs is that, you know, oh, they're out of stock again and or they don't have any selection. Um, so right now, the best LP that I've seen is Canna Farms. They have all of the genetic material as well. And uh, so anybody that's going for their medical cannabis right now, that's who I'm recommending. They've got very good cannabis. Um, so uh, you can have some bad things happen, white powdery mildew, but that's preventable. There are a lot of things, but just good growing techniques you won't, uh, you can avoid. But spider mites come in because of infestations from other people. So keep pe other people out of your crop. When you go to the grow store to get stuff and you come back in, don't walk into your grow. Take all your clothes off in the garage, your shoes, and I'm serious about this, bag it and wash it. Because I have seen more infections come back from grow stores than that's the only thing the person did. 
Um, so keep your environment clean. Uh, don't go outside and garden and then go inside your green room. Uh, you need to wear different clothes and keep it a sterile environment. And if you keep it sterile, then you're going to keep 90% of the problems out. And the other 10% are people. So, sorry. <laughs> um, so um, MMARs and MMPRs are caught between a rock and a hard place because they're, they're sort of grandfathered, but eventually they're going to lose their... Um, Crystal, someone yeah. got their hand oh, up. Um, they're going to lose their uh, ability to grow 99 plants. Sorry, sorry, Fred. Um, the spider mites, uh, uh, it's a terrible, obviously, number one problem. But when you grew like 800 acres or whatever you grew outside, <laughs> how did you... You don't. Exactly. <laughs> um, so for the, the smaller grower who's going to put it maybe in their backyard or something like that, what agricultural tips can you give? Your farming, Ray. It's, it's, you, the deer can come up and eat them. Your neighbor's kids. I mean, that's the risk of don't going outside. Um, it, eventually, it's going to go to mass farming with production and, and it, people are going to ignore it because you can buy uh, um, you know, a jar of oil for five bucks. It's just going to be like making canola oil. It's ex actually, it's a cheaper way of doing it, but it's very, very, very similar. So, um, so these guys are having a little bit of trouble. And so LPs, um, I've helped some LPs and some don't listen and, and they, they get to the sell point, but then they have no product to sell because it went moldy. So, oh, this is old. Sorry, did, I went on a little topic. I'm going to go off and go about there. So outdoor crops, this is going to be the future. Uh, cropping, and this is actually a hemp crop. So you can tell that this last slide, this is not hemp. This, this is cannabis. And there's male flowers standing out here, and those are your females right here. But um, that's Mexican style, is growing, you, and you flower it, and you seed it out. There's a question, Crystal? Sorry? Fort Vermillion last summer. So there's lots of grows. I mean, it's uh, uh, BC, I've seen hundreds of them. Uh, but outdoors is pretty unsuccessful and they get ripped off. So I always recommend indoors, it's much more secure. And the Senate last night, well, I think we're all good uh, in Alberta. So um, I, I did not hear confirmed whether it's five plants per household or four. They didn't say that, but initially I was hearing reports it was going to go from four to five plants for recreational, but I don't care because I grow 25 plants. So, and I think everybody should look at having their medical uh, license and grow that way instead of recreational because there's a lot more um, stigma on recreational, whereas it, even going smoking a pot, I can be out front smoking and cop can't do anything because I'm a medical patient. Uh, but recreationally, they can, or they will in the future with uh, municipal laws. So questions? <clears throat> oh, hi, here we come. Oh my gosh. Hmm. Good day, good day. Crystal Got a question high. for you. Um, oh, sorry. Um, what are your thoughts around using microbials uh, to help your plants grow? Um, absolutely, but are you purchasing these and adding them to your soils? Yes, or um, I'm growing them myself. Oh, absolutely. If you're doing it cost effectively and doing it yourself, I wouldn't go out and buy them and add them. You know, but definitely, um, I use a compost um, soil, and I believe that your, uh, whatever you're growing is like growing wine. You grow uh, out of better soil, and you're going to get or different soils. You're going to get different results from the same plant. So I believe in giving uh, full nutrients, and we add our vegetative um, um, fertilizer, but not every day. Uh, you know, we add water every second watering. So we cut down on the amount of fertilizer. You know, fertilizer jugs last oh, yeah, years no, for us. Like, I mean, if you're using, like, uh, azosporillium, for example, or uh, mycelium herds or whatever, I mean, they're going to reduce your amount of fertilizers you need as well as improve your root system and break yep. down the organic components in the soil, plus provide PGRs to improve your plants. So... Oh, excellent, excellent. I, um, I haven't got there yet, same as a CO2 room. I have been in them, but I've never built one myself. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's nice to see and know it's there. But uh, if you go on my website, you'll see I'm pretty basic as, as, as how I am. I'm, uh, you make sure you have good um, um, circulation of air 
and cold air at night is always best. So if you're growing outdoors, um, nighttime is our mountainous areas. Calgary's perfect for that. Yeah, um, when you typically, when we clone is um, uh, two weeks before you go into flower. Um, so take off the bottom branches, the ones that are not getting the buds up to the right height that we've, we've set on our trellises. Um, and um, you cut those branches off, and use a razor blade that's clean, um, sterile, wear gloves, um, and uh, cut it on a 45, um, and you're, you have to have nodes coming off of it. Cut your main leaf, fan leaves back as much as possible. The big one's gone totally. So you have a, just a little thing going in, rooting hormone and into the cube or solo cup. Yeah, you can get a powder or a gel. And it just, uh, it helps. One thing that, that you should not do is uh, take your rooting hormone, spread it on something, and don't take your root and put it right in the container of rooting hormone because then you can contaminate your container. Oh yeah, so you know, little, just little tips. Now your ruining hormone is uh, you're not sterilized, so then your your next set of clones don't come out. Um, we have <laughs> my buddy. I'm amazed. He's got 100% success rate for five years. Um, I, he's just he's awesome at it. Um, I don't even worry about it. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but it, it's so easy to do. It it it. Um, but again, sterile environment. And that's the same with keeping bugs out. Have a good sterile environment. And, um, you know, um, I have seen grows that have foot um, baths before you walk in uh, with bleach so that, you know, all your shoes are cleaned off every time you walk in. But again, that's in an environment where people were coming into the facility uh, more of an, on an LP style. So um, every, every situation is different, but you need to have the same controls for heat and humidity, especially. Hi there. Hi. Uh, quick question. Could you speak to any of your preferences for, there's various grow methods, deep water culture, hydroponics, aeroponics, soil. Uh, is there any method that's in your, like, that you prefer, that you can speak to that would be better than another, that has an advantage? Um, I grow in soil just because I'm old school. I, my first crop was 1976. Um, so I, I don't consider myself, I'm not a master grower, I'm a veteran. That's what I classify myself as. Um, I grow in soil. I just, that's the way I did it. I've always done it. It's the same as growing tomatoes. I mean, um, I farmed my whole life. When I was a, a kid, I learned how to grow things. So I just used those techniques and, uh, and stayed at home on soil. But I have seen um, all projects. The problem I have with um, any of the water products is uh, just humidity control. Uh, when you get to that flowering stage, you need uh, to be less than 20% humidity as far as I'm concerned in the last two weeks. You want to knock that humidity down so it's just sucking that moisture out of the buds and it draws the terpenes out of them and makes the flavoring much better. Um, if they're too moist, you get mold. And so you need to be below 40% at least to contain the mold. So uh, that's just my thoughts on it. Um, I have seen good successful hydroponic system, uh, systems out there. So. People do it very well, so it's up to you. Anyone? Yeah. Hi there. Um, uh, I recently um, had some um, marijuana that was grown outside, and it contained uh, seeds. And, and is that because there was males and females outside? Um, not necessarily. Um, so what, what THC was the, the pot that you grow, grew outside? Oh. And, or, and uh, CBD. Who knows? Who knows? Oh, Who knows? Okay. You know, you know, um, I, ha I had a slide. Uh, Dana Larson is is providing seeds for um, Overgrow Canada for free on his website. Just go and register, and he'll mail you free seeds. Go go plant them and make them into these small little guys, and then go plant them in municipal structures and that sort of thing. So that's called Overgrow Canada. So you can get your seeds for free. Um, sorry, I m missed your question. Was I was there seeds in your outdoor grow? Um, and if there was, how much? Uh, what did you have to do to control them? Um, I get seeds in my indoor grow. In your indoor grow? Yeah. In your, so my, my, my females go hermy. That's one of the problems with getting feminized seeds, and that's the best way to start is by having feminized. But, you know, I, <laughs> the other day, I'm rolling joints, and the seeds are popping out of this bud. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's one bud. It's centralized. It's just there. 
And okay. you, so you have one little banana sticking out that you didn't see. If you ever see those yellow bananas sticking out of your female buds, I cut them out immediately. And then you won't seed. But it will seed that little area, absolutely. Um, okay. Keep the seeds. They're viable, and they're, 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 but they will be hermy. 100% chance they will okay. be hermy. Anybody else?